Okay, everybody. Thank you and, uh, for joining us in this session. We're here to talk about AI and contextual computing. Let me introduce the panel of speakers to you. We have Antoine Boudes here. He's the research lead at Facebook AI Research Paris, France. Next, we have Alexandra Ruiz, Co Watson Cognitive and Analytics Services line leader, and uh, Philippe Casula, co-founder and CEO of Talent France. Now, the interesting thing about this panel's construction is that Antoine is in research, Alexandra is in, the, is in applications, and Philip is in implementation. So we have a really well-rounded panel here today. So let's just get things started. Um, perhaps we could start with a clear definition of what contextual AI is. Because I've got to be honest, when I looked into it, the first thing that came to mind was context, data, uh, context-aware advertising, but that's not really the only application out there. So, Alexandra, maybe you could tell us, you know, what is context-aware AI and what functions fall under this category? Okay. So, so first of all, let me explain why context awareness is so important. This is really important because we have, we've got that. All your digital applications are blind and deaf. With that, you can train system and provide some brand new value-added and intelligent services to your user, meaning it could be employees, it could be clients as well. For example, you can develop some virtual assistant which will be able to provide you some answer to your question, but also to understand who you are based on your personality, based on your emotion, and to provide you some good recommendation based on the question that you ask or based on your intents or your needs and also to automate some actions for you. So it's not just text-based, it can be visual, it can be environmental. Correct. You can use visual, you can use voice, you can use text. It's a kind of mix. This is important. The more you mix different services together, the more value added that you have by using AI to your customers. Where does contextual AI fall into in terms of the broad AI um, types? Is it more machine learning? Is it more speech recognition? Where does it fall under? So, well, you have both. It's essentially um, machine learning. And I think that Antoine will also discuss about machine reasoning in a couple of seconds. So machine learning is really key because based on that, you can train system, you can develop uh, based on your uh, internal and external data, structure and unstructure, so that you can uh, have your machine learning about uh, all your information, all your uh, services, offerings as well, and provide these services uh, to customers. Thanks very much, Alexandra. So with that basis of explanation, Antoine, maybe you could, I mean, you work as a, an AI researcher, so you must get a lot of questions, both intelligent and maybe a bit silly. <laughs> what, what do you find to be the biggest misconceptions about AI? Where are we to science fiction, or maybe where are we not uh, ambitious enough? Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, it's been, I've been doing research on AI for like 15 years now, um, and so I've seen a, a lot of, uh, of the new technology arrive. Um, I completely agree with Alexandra in the sense that contextual uh, and contextual data is going to change the way the AI system is wo are working. But you have to realize the new challenges that it brings to the system. Right now, the AI are capable of doing simple tasks and on one type of data. They are capable of recognizing objects or they are capable of playing chess or they are capable of like making translation or recognize voice. Okay, These are very important topic, but usually the AI is doing them in isolation. So when you bring the context, and you mentioned multimodality, that is very important, you, be, you basically expect the system to be able to handle like multimodal information and to be able to put like correspondences between what's in an image, what's in the sound, and what's in the text, for instance. And this is super interesting. It can bring new application, but these are much, much, much new world challenges. So we're not about to have hell from, Odyssey, from Space Odyssey turn up and control everything. No, I mean, it, it, this is like, uh, so that, that's why uh, you have to realize the difference between uh, the movie Her or the science fiction and what we can do now. Once again, right now we can build a system that can be pretty powerful for doing one thing. And they can do it pretty well, and usually the thing is supposed to be well defined. Okay? If I take the, the machine that is able to detect objects in, uh, in images, for instance, and I try to make it like, so that is going to translate from French to English, this is nonsense. It doesn't even make sense to try it right now. So you could try it, it will be completely random. 
Okay. So, um, I guess another misconception that I personally had until I spoke more to IBM Watson people is that I thought Watson was one big brilliant AI, but actually it's a collection of um, AI application technologies. Is that correct, Alessandra? Yes, that's correct. But you know, there is no magic at all. So in order to have a performance uh, system like Watson, you need to train it. Okay, so it's all about data. It's all about transparency also, meaning that you need to know who is going to use this data, how this data are going to be used as well, and, um, and, 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 and for, for which purpose they are going to be used. So maybe we, uh, it's a good time for us to move on to perhaps con back to context, more specifically towards context-aware AI and uh, applications that businesses can use it for. I mean, why, why does everybody care so much about it? Um, what's so interesting about it? Maybe, Philippe, you want to take this one. Well, uh, we, we believe that uh, AI, and of course, contextual aware AI, will be crucial in the, in the necessary transformation of businesses, uh, where uh, speed, responsiveness, agility will be the key levers and the key success factor for the future. And uh, obviously, the, the power of context aware is, is, uh, is uh, in, in the B2C business and in the sales and marketing process. It's obvious, you, you, you're gonna have tailor offer due to those technology. You're gonna go from uh, uh, predictive model to prescriptive models, and this is very powerful. And it's obvious in the B2C business. But there are some areas for application and it's endless. The range of application will be endless. We have got an example. We are working entirely in Talon on an application which is called uh, Dynergo, which means dynamic ergonomy, where we collect data from uh, 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 a user using an application, a web page, a screen, and we collect data from his clickology, where does he click, from his uh, movement of the mouse, from well, a lot of different data, and then with machine learning, we try to define an emotional profile of this uh, user, and then combining UX capabilities, UI expertise, and psychology, we can make, uh, we can redesign the application, we can redesign the screen to fit with the emotional profile of the user. I've got another example. It's, it's not in B2C and it's not based on user. We've got a fantastic uh, startup just in our lab, just across the pathway. The startup is called Quantcube. They collect data from satellite pictures and then they run machine learning and they can analyze a shipping activity, they can analyze um, a manufacturing activity and they can predict growth, economic growth in a region, in a, in a, in a country and they give those analyses to the financial market and it's pure, you know, using context using weather condition, satellite picture, and then translating into very relevant data for investment. Very interesting. And so what I'm getting from this conversation is that context-aware AI is largely about gathering the right kinds of data and then apply, maybe an, even use another AI to process the data and come up with recommendations. Um, perhaps, Antoine, you could tell us why Facebook has an AI research lab and what do you do there and why context-aware AI is so important to Facebook? Yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, maybe it seems obvious now, but three years ago, which is not that long ago, Facebook didn't have any, like, integrated AI, AI team. It was just that like, all the teams had a few AI research, uh, research or engineers in them, but yet there was no AI team. And since then, we created, like, two big teams that are, like, more than... I don't know, 400 people total. One is the applied research group who's going to go to all the product teams and provide them like all the AI services that they need. Like they go to Instagram, they go to Messenger, they go to Feed Ranking, etc. And they help them to develop their AI in an integrated manner. And we have the, also the AI lab uh, where I'm, where, that I'm part of. And uh, basically the AI lab, the mission is like, Basically, the reasoning of Mark Zuckerberg was like, if we just have the applied machine learning group that is going to work for the product team, we're going to be not going to be at the front of the AI uh, innovation. We need to have a group that is going to be able to be at the front, try the new thing, and work at the edge of AI. And so that's why Facebook AI research exists. And that's also why we are not committed to any product, but our mission is really to try to push forward the technology. And, um, and uh, we do that 
uh, with the Facebook group, but also with the academic community. We work with acad universities, we work with students, uh, we, we do open source of our code because we really try to be part of the edge of the AI community and try to push the technology further. So tell me about your work at uh, Facebook. I understand you focus mostly on translation and syn natural syntax awareness. Um, so not only, I mean, I, I really like the, the machine translation uh, application because this is one that is core to Facebook mission about trying to connect people all around the world. And this is one where basically we're investing a lot in the lab to try to make it like easier and faster. And the philosophy is that we basically release in open source a machine, a machine uh, translation system that is state of the art uh, on multiple languages three, more, three weeks ago. So that's also part of our philosophy. But we don't only do that. We do speech recognition. We do machine reasoning to try to have machine that are able to do deduction or reasoning. We do like uh, image recognition. We do image catch captioning. Um, we do basically all the spectrum of AI. We don't, because we want to be able to have the best pieces everywhere, right? So we, that's what we do. So tell me, if I, when, when I use Facebook, where am I encountering your research? Is it in uh, the trans, like when they say like, you know, translate this into a different language, or if I am um, using a chatbot, or is this where your research comes into play? Yeah, so basically what's important to, uh, to see is that we are not go do going to do our research to, uh, to for an application. So it's not like Messenger comes to the lab and says, hey guys, we need a, be a better chatbot, can you do it for us? It's more like... We in the lab decide that basically chatbot needs to be improved and to use contextual information or this kind of thing. And so we are going to launch a research project there. But what happens is that when we find something and when we have something that works better, because that's what we try to do, then yes, we go to Messenger and we tell them, hey guys, I think we have something that you might like to use. And so as a result, uh, basically they then adapt the product to use what we have. But it's not like directly, basically they will use the flavor of what we have, but usually they're going to implement it in their own way. That's exactly why we have the Applied Machine Learning Group who's basically doing the transition. They're going to take over our tech, discuss with the product group and implement it. And as a result, basically what we do is more or less all over Facebook, a small touch, um, but w and sometimes it's a full product. And the machine translation, the full product, when you use it, is basically powered by what we did. Okay. So there, there are so many applications right now that, you know, that don't go, hey, hello, I'm AI, you know, I'm bing. Um, you might, that's inter you interact with it all over the place. And I think one of the most ubiquitous is IBM's Watson. Um, maybe you could share with us some of the, the more common and popular applications of Watson's contextual AI function that, uh, that are in the marketplace that maybe people don't even know they're interacting with. Yes, so regarding uh, IBM Watson, I would say that um, we are very good in chatbots um, that we call virtual assistant, uh, virtual advisor, virtual concierge as well. Um, in fact, this is a chatbot that we provide to end user. It could be employees, it could be uh, clients. You will be able to chat with that AI and, and ask questions, and AI will be able to understand your intent, and based on that, uh, you can have a conversation, but also the intent will be able to understand your project if you have one, and to provide you some good recommendation to um, prepare this project. So this is a really, really uh, application-oriented um, project um, for, from AI. Uh, we have started to work on AI more than 20 years ago. Um, so now this is no more, I would say, uh, research-oriented. This is really business-oriented. and. We have a lot of um, application case now in different sectors. It could be in finance, it could be also in, in public sector. So, um, so could, you, could you give an interesting example of, say, not so much, B, not so much within the public sector or, um, or B2B or finance, maybe something that people are more likely to encounter it. Um, in terms of, I believe Watson works a lot with the North Face, for example, is that would this fall under the same category where the, the um, in order to get in-store recommendations or they understand what people want? Yes. The so um, consumer brands. So, for example, within the office, you can have uh, Watson assisting the relationship manager. 
in charge of preparing a, 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 a meeting with a client and will be able to ask questions to, to Watson and to, to the AI in order to get some knowledge, expertise coming from the whole enterprise, enterprise um, um, database and be able to, to well prepare his, his meeting with the client and based on that, the meeting will be more value oriented due to the fact that he will have all information based on, on the client, emotion, personality to, uh, to, 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 to orient uh, all services and offerings to the client. Wow. Imagine if all meetings were monitored by Watson to see how you're reacting, your level of interest. <laughs> That would be interesting. Uh, Philippe, maybe you have a few, working with as many companies as you do, you know, what are the more, in, what to you are the more interesting or unusual applications of uh, AI that you've seen? Oh, there are a lot of unusual applications based on those technology. And, and because, you know, basically uh, with the research, with the technology, we can do whatever you want and we don't know what's going to happen, you know. It, it, this is why we say in Talon, we need dreamers to think about the new application. What are we going to do uh, with this, this research, which is really evolving in, in a good way, with technology, which is ready now. You know, it, not, it is not at all like in the 2000 years uh, with the big bubble internet. Now technology is ready. Now we've got access, we've got device, we've got network, we've got everything. And we can see a very, uh, very uh, interesting application. We've, we, we are involved in a project with Harvard because today, uh, basically, we can't do a project without co-creation. Co-creation is uh, with experts, with customers, with business users, with university, with research. And we are involved in a project with Harvard University to create a virtual laboratory and it's going to be very powerful. We are involved with uh, another startup which is uh, looking at environmental issues and they want to clean the air and, uh, and this is great and they are using, using machine learning and of course AI so, uh, and, and contextual data. So I think that we are at the beginning of the story. I'm confident in the technology and it will be well. But I think also that we need us uh, all around the table to get prepared we need to adopt we need to trust the technology and this is kind of an issue for the moment we are involved in some proof of concept with some customer on predictive maintenance project and sometimes the user says well it's my experience I know better than the machine and they have to give a little bit of their experience to fit the technology, to fit the, 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 the machine learning process, and especially when it's supervised. So they have to trust the technology and they have to, to believe in it. And it's very important in terms of the change that will happen in the next years. Has the trust thing been a problem for either of you? Maybe we can start with Alexandra. It's, uh, has tr uh, getting, getting people to trust the technology that it really will work and that it is perhaps better than the current system that's in place. Yes, this is really key to have people to adopt this brand new technology yeah, because all we said that this is very new, this is something coming from labs, we have now some, some, some concrete uh, business application, however, we need everyone now to use that. It could be available from your any device, from your smartphone, from your digital app um, to use the AI and chat with it and, and get some, uh, some, some information from it. But Again, uh, this is something very powerful, but we need to have everybody to, to use it. How do you get them to overcome their trust problems? Like, what, what, techni what techniques do either you or Philippe use to um, get a client or a customer to actually believe, hey, this actually works and it, it gets better with time? For, for us, it's, 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 it's not simple, but it's, we've got a way to involve them in the project and they will fit the technology they will see the result and they will see wh where the, the their personal added value will move because they will still keep a, a role very important they will still have this experience which is crucial for the business but they will they will move to even more added value so you're saying that basically you have to make sure the ego is is okay it's <laughs> part of the problem you know when when you know when you've got a captor who's going to decide to make an action and this action used to be done by someone going on the field, this someone will tell you, well, I know, you don't need this action. The technology is just, you know, too, uh, you know, too demanding. And then after, when you, when you go into context-aware AI, etc., and you, 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 you make 
this business user fit the, the technology and you make it realize that it's very powerful and that it will be, you know, in his, in his, in his task, it will get more value to analyze the result and then you win. But there is a change management process to be done. Okay. But what about uh, your internal? Do you have trouble even in Facebook getting people to, to uh, say, oh, it, this actually does work and it will do what it says? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a general process because even if you have clients or if you're within Facebook and you try to work with product teams, this is a bit of the same. Look, I have my system, I know it works, it's working very well. Uh, maybe UI is interesting, but uh, I know it's not going to be disruptive. So we have to maintain, I mean, Facebook is great for that because there is a very great culture of innovation uh, and a disruptive technology within the company is super well accepted. So basically, usually we don't have this kind of uh, behavior because people are more open to welcome the change and because we know that, I mean, this is starting to be a big company, but basically they will all have, I think, a startup effect in terms of the, the market is changing very fast, the usage is changing very fast, so we have to be able to adapt. We adapt it to video, we adapt it to mobile. So, um, so when they say, and now I think people in the product team, they say, okay, we took the, the mobile uh, turn well, we took the video turn well, we don't have to miss the AI turn. So, uh, so that's basically why, basic, when we arrive, they might be saying, okay, why would I use this because this works? And then they realize, okay, but this might work like twice as best. Well, okay, let's... Let's talk about a subject that uh, geeks love, which is the future. What do you think we are hopefully a breakthrough away or two away from? What do you, and what AI developments do you think businesses really need to get ready for? Shall we start with yes? Yeah, yeah, I can start. Um, so I mean, it's uh, it's, di it's difficult for a researcher to basically project ten years ahead and uh, try to to write science fiction. We try to do the the other way. <laughs> Let's but, make it shorter then. But uh, but I, I think that the, and it was also connected to the previous session. I think I think we are going to do like uh, very big advances in like personal assistance uh, because we get to know better what people want assistance for first of all. So. This is actually useful because you don't develop like uh, an assistant in the wide, in openly, which is very hard for an AI, as I said at the beginning. Because if you try to do an AI that is going to solve everything, then basically it doesn't work very well for, uh, for anything. But if you know that there are typical usage for which the AI is going to be very important and an assistant would be very key, very an addition, then yes, I think we can make a great of progress. And actually, we released yesterday um, a paper that, uh, so it's just a paper, research paper, about uh, an assistant that is able to do negotiation for you. So basically, let's say you have, you are in the negotiations game and you try to get the best deal out of your, uh, out of your uh, colleague. Well, basically, we are trying to develop chatbot in this situation that try to basically find the best uh, negotiation strategy for you. So it doesn't mean that it's going to solve everything, but this is a, a new capability that might be interesting in some, uh, in some cases. And so I think that we're going to make a lot of progress in specific domain application for personal assistance. Well, I'm in the process of trying to buy a house and if I can get a chatbot to negotiate for me with the real estate agents, that would be amazing because those people are... <laughs> so apologies to any people in real estate in the audience. Um, let's talk about the future with uh, uh, Philippe. In terms of future, I'm, I'm, I believe, well, we've got conviction that due to technology, due to research, AI will be everywhere, will be in a few year times, everywhere, and it will be transparent. Uh, we won't even know that it's AI. So it's, it's a huge turn in terms of using technology and, 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 and creating new, new, new business case with this technology. And from my point of view, in terms of system integrator and consultancy, I have to create new profile. Education is, a, is an issue in terms of being able to follow the, the technology, being able to follow this, this, this pressure on, on uh, analysis data. So we decided to be very involved in the, in the educational and, and training process in France. We have created two shares of, um, uh, you know, uh, enterprise shares, uh, the shared entreprise, specific to, to, um, to create the new expert of tomorrow, to create the data expert of tomorrow, where you have to deal with not a pure data coming from your internal system, but you have to deal with amount, huge amount of data that you don't know, that you have to correlate, correlate etc. So it's a new way, and we are working with university, with, uh, with uh, uh, business, with enterprise, because we believe in, in collective intelligence, and I think that that's uh, the main um, 
stake for the future. So where does IBM see all this going? Yeah, so uh, for us, in the very near future, we are convinced that AI will be everywhere. It will be at the doctor's office, it will be in your car, it will be also... Will people be okay with this though? I mean, um, will they understand enough about AI not to be completely freaked out by it by that point? Yes, yeah, so again, uh, this is very important, this is a key principle, you have to be transparent. You have to inform all users that you are going to use AI, that data will remain a privacy as well, and how you are going to use this privacy data. This is really, again, key, and you need to be transparent in that. Especially when you go to the doctor's office, for example, we have, a, um, again, a business application case at, uh, with oncology. So um, for that, we need to deal with sensitive data, and this is very important that the user knows that we are going to use his own data. But regarding the future, we have also some strong belief. Huh? We, we, we are convinced that um, we are going to move from machine learning to machine reasoning, again, to provide you some, some very value-added services. For example, your AI will be able to understand that your fridge is empty, so you need to do some shopping, but you will not do the shopping. Your AI will do the shopping for you <laughs> over the web and have all your package with a, um, a direct delivery to your fridge. So that's going to be the future based on machine reasoning. So the, to and, and I dream yeah. about AI just saying that don't wear a jacket today, it would be too hot, you know, my personal assistant. <laughs> well, I've got my wife, but it's not enough. <laughs> well, it would be good if the AI was controlling the climate in, the, in this place. I think we all agree it's a bit on the warm side inside here. So in context, to put things in context, um, context-aware AI, is AI that is capable of gathering data via visual, text, um, environment. And it, basically, it's AI designed to get data and intelligence to feed to a system that can help analyze and apply it. And uh, it's everywhere and it's getting more ubiquitous. And the reason why people will be okay with AI being everywhere is that we're really, really lazy. And it's really quite nice and we don't have to worry about the small things in life because there's someone taking care of us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.